Thanks to that piece of <laughs> lieutenant that's always uh, on his podcast. Pass <laughs> us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. Welcome to 265 Police Live, the finest unfiltered. I'm Eric Dibb, your most complaint cop, NYPD. And along with me is the founder and co-host of the podcast, John McCarry, Tiny Lieutenant. And of course, Paul Manicone, who runs a page just right at PD, our video production leader. How you guys doing? Outstanding. Thank you so much. It's going to be a good show, guys. We're actually talking about micromanagement with the NYPD. It's been a hot topic, especially surrounding the appointment of Kaz Daughtry, who's the Assistant Commissioner of the Police Department. John, let's go right into it. Let's talk about an incident that happened with a barricaded perpetrator and how it correlates to micromanagement. John, let's talk about an incident in the 114 precinct. Yeah, absolutely. We got a, we got a lot of messages about this. Uh, we decided to bring on Paul because he's a big fan of Chief Shell. So we want <laughs> <laughs> So we just want to go through the incident. I mean, it's it's out there on social media. There's a 10-minute clip. We got a clip sent to us numerous times from all you guys. Thank you for everyone that sends us stuff. Um, from Brooklyn Drivers, a, a TikTok handle, Brooklyn Drivers. So if you go to TikTok, 10-minute clip, um, much longer. I'll play a shorter clip. Um, which you're going to see. So let's get right into it, and then, and then Paul, we'll, we'll kick it to you right, right after that. I'm going to play the clip now. 114, Sergeant. If the perp is still barricaded. Or? If the perp is still barricaded, okay. Yeah, he's getting out of his apartment in the hallway right now. Thank uh, you. Have you also awesome come floor await the arrival of ESU? Everybody, Bert. Clear the floor, await the arrival of ESU. Since you read that message out loud. 14 CO, sir. 14 CO. Who's advising? Chief of the Department of Service is advising. Four. Four shooting. Uh, Operation time. Please, all you need, stand by from the floor, uh, waiting on the ESU. Authority. 114 CO. I need to know if there's shots fired by Amber West, yes or no? Affirmative, affirmative. Affirmative to what? Shots with... Uh, 114 CO in here. Yeah. Hey, first of all, you got the radio, everyone else stays off radio. Are there shots fired by Amber West? That's affirmative. The perpetrator was in the hallway, armed with firearms. 14 CO. What do you think about that, Paul? Well, I mean, where do you begin? The first thing that, you know, jumps out is you don't hear anyone asking. You know that cops, they said that shots were fired, and neither one of them ask if there's any injured MOS. Uh, that, that's the first thing. Um, it started with... Kaz, and then it was Chief Shell, correct? Assistant Commissioner Kaz comes over the radio, says to clear the hallway. Clear the hallway. And await the arrival of the SU. That's to, that I, to I, me just wanted, I, I just want to know, Paul, sorry to interrupt you, but while he was saying this, was he on Google Maps and actually able to see the hallway? I know. I know. It's just, but I mean... This, you know, this is a great, great episode of micromanaging when it goes too far. It's not just like everyday micromanaging that people deal with in the corporate world, because I'm sure a lot of people have bosses like that. But in this particular situation, it could really lead to a cop getting killed. And I hope hopefully there's some pushback on this because that was it was disgusting to hear. We all know that you need to be on scene to make a determination. Now, I've heard duty captains say, wait until I get there because they're going to be on scene and they have a bit of an obligation if you got the duty that night. Um, but usually they're a minute or two out and the, the, the highest ranking officer on scene is supposed to make the call, not people in one PP that are watching your, your body camera footage. It's disgusting, but more importantly, it's dangerous. This thing has so much teeth and there's so much to grab on to, get, to speak about. But first thing to say is, you made a good point. You said, I hope that there's some pushback on this, right? But where is the pushback going to come from? 
it's coming from the podcast, right? It's coming from people that are retired, but active guys that are on the job, they can't push back. Where is the pushback coming from? This is pretty much coming from the highest ranking members of the department. The highest ranking members of the department are the least inadequate right now. Micromanagement is the most ineffective tool or style of leadership that you can apply. I've said this, we talk about this. You can micromanage a system, but you cannot micromanage people. It deteriorates any potential for creative thinking. And John and I, when we did a podcast about nepotism and Kaz Daughtry's leadership role and his appointment in the police department, the mystique and the misunderstanding and the misguiding and, and no vision in the department and not understanding is, is he a civilian member or he's a uniform member, what his actual rank and billet puts lives at risk, we foreshadowed. And this incident in particular is a prime example of putting lives at risk in a micromanagement situation. And I say this, micromanage, micromanagement of the NYPD is a byproduct of their incompetence. Absolutely. It's a byproduct of their incompetence. And I notice a lot the people that trust their supervisors and their subordinates the least are self-reflecting on what they did as cops and what and who they were. And a lot of the micromanagement stems from what they did in their own head when they were police officers, when they were sergeants, when they were lieutenants, when they were captains. And they don't want anyone else doing what they did. You know, and and you'll notice that all the time with guys who come in late every day, but they'll, you know, they'll have a big problem if one of one of their subordinates comes in late. You know, things of that nature. But I mean, I think the biggest thing for me listening to that audio is we're all cops. We've all been on scenes before. I mean, we've all been on crazy jobs where the radio is it's just blowing up, right? And you don't have all the information, whether you're the CO. Whether you're the sergeant who responded, you might even be the first responding officer, and you don't even have every single detail of that job to lay out perfectly on the radio. There's going to be details that, that we're missing on the radio. You know, the police department today wants everything in a moment's notice. Everyone needs to know everything. It's just not going to happen. But to tell someone to clear the floor when you have no idea if they have their guns drawn down on this individual right now, if they're staring at him, if they're in the middle of affecting arrest, about to affect arrest, I mean, you're going to get somebody killed. I mean, that yeah. is, it's egregious, dude. It really is. It's, it's a major fail that needs serious correction right away. And by what I hear, he's the next first deputy commissioner of the police department. And it's it's uh, honestly he's completely unqualified and and he's and and he's immature and 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 this is just another example. That's the thing um, when people think of the times that they may have had a boss that micromanaged not just in the police department but in private in the private sector. Hopefully, the person that's giving you that advice or is looking over your shoulder and advice is obviously different than micromanaging, right? But at least that person knows more than you do. At least that person comes from a position of competence, the person cares about you, and they kind of know what they're doing. It happens with senior guys and rookies, right? I have no problem being a rookie sergeant if a lieutenant or a captain was looking over my shoulder and telling me that I'm doing something wrong or do it like this or do it like that because he's earned where he is, right? I have, I've had captains that micromanage everything and it drives you crazy. But in situations where you go from first grade detective to assistant commissioner, he's not qualified. And you have no right to tell these people that are dealing with the situation at hand what they need to be doing. There, there's so many layers to this, and I just want to peel something back. The first thing I want to talk about is this. I personally have been extremely critical of the leadership of the NYPD, it's an epic fit. John and I both, Paul, you as well, we've been extremely critical and we should because it needs to get better. However, I'll say this, all right? Because I'm, I'm not here to personally attack them. I'm, I'm here to attack the system, what's in place right now, and they are part of it. And I like to believe, and we all would like to believe, because we were all cops, that there is a part of them that actually cares 
that wants to help, but they can't because they're at one police plaza. But this is where good leadership comes into play. You have to have the maturity. John, I want to reflect on what you said. It's outstanding. You have to have the maturity, the experience, and the discipline to actually stand out. That's what makes you a good leader also, is knowing when to act and when to stand out. And this was the perfect opportunity to stand down and just listen. And sometimes to be a good listener is a better active role as a leader than being a talker. And they're talking too much and they're not actually listening to what's going on with their people, what they're feeling, the emotion that's involved, the tackle nightmare that they're involved in. But they're just talking because they're egomaniacs and they're incompetent. They lack the discipline to stand down, which would make a good leader to make this fluid situation flow and not be a dangerous situation for them. What instead their ego make there because they're incompetent, their egos trump the situation. And what the only thing that they should be doing, even if they're the best, just like you said, it doesn't matter if they're better or not, but they're not the ones in that active role. They should be there just in a supportive role. John and I spoke about this offline. If anything, they could go on the radio and say, listen, we're here. We're listening. You have our support. If there's any resources you need, we will send them. And that's it. Now, they could do a post-op analysis after the situation unfolds at a later time and have a conference and discuss what happened and to move forward, how to make things better. That's what good leaders do. And they're not good leaders. Absolutely inadequate. No, that was an embarrassment. I mean, that whole radio transmission, every cop that heard it was disgusted by it. Even big supporters of them, even people that support them, sent me and Herrick that and were like, what the hell? Listen to this. This is ridiculous. Um, I do think their hearts are in the right place. I just don't think their heads are in the right place. I think, you know, at the end of the day, they're looking at themselves as the quarterback for the team and they know better than everyone else. The quarterback on that job that day was the 114 CEO. Uh, he's got more experience than assistant commissioner Kaz in the rank of executive, never mind in supervisory rank. So I think they should have stood down on that. I don't blame Chief Shell for wanting to get the info, but I think when you listen to that, the info that he requests tells a lot. Tells a lot about where his head lies and where the priorities lie. And again, I'm not saying that it's it's being done intentionally. You know, I, I do think that, you know, I do think that Shell's a hard worker. I think Kaz is a hard worker. Um, I think that they're, they're, they're working for a very incompetent mayor right now. And and that makes me question them. And then their actions on top of it are, are awful. Um, you know, you hear what Shell asks. Were there any shots fired by MOS? That's your concern. Right. With any, that's your number one concern. You weren't care. You didn't. You, you didn't care if any shots were fired at MOS. You only asked one question: Were shots fired by MOS? Meaning, oh, now we have to come out here and investigate these cops. Now it's going to be a big deal. Now it's going to be a media event. Now I got to explain it to the mayor. Right. <laughs> that's all the things that we would that that you heard. That that one question tells a whole story about the leadership in the NYPD right now. So I, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed for them. And I don't blame them why they're all over my LinkedIn at five o'clock in the morning too. And they're up at night for, for me saying absolutely nothing other than what I think. And that's in my heart and in my head. So, you know. You had said that you think their, their heart's in the right place. I don't know if that's true. And this is why I say that. When you micromanage, when you want to get involved, and I'm a hands-on guy, I've always been, uh, I used to tell the cops that I work with, tell me what it is you're about to do so I can help you. Don't do stuff behind my back. I can help you. And, and that's how I was taught. I equate this to like, there's two different types of people that do this. Let's say you're a parent. My eight-year-old is in a recital this week. If she's on stage, you know, my heart is racing because I don't want her to make a mistake. If your kid is on the field playing baseball, you almost want to go out there and help them, help him or her if they're struggling, right? In that particular situation, you get involved as much as you can because you care about the person. When you have people that are transferring other bosses 
because they're not yelling attention when you walk into the precinct. Their heart is not in the right place. They're on a power trip. Those are the types of people that micromanage, not from a standpoint of, I want to help you and I care about you, and I just want to make sure you're doing the right thing. They're coming at it from a point where I'm in control, I'm the man, and if you don't listen to me, you're booted. I have no respect for those people. I, I saw on my lieutenant's wall, he had a, a, my, uh, my SOL when I was a sergeant, he had a sign that said, good leaders command respect, weak leaders demand respect. You can't run around hoping or, dip or, or insisting that people respect you. It's earned. When you start off up here and start having people transferred because they didn't call attention, you're on a power trip. And I knew sergeants like that. We know cops like that, right? They, they, they get on the job. They shouldn't be a cop. And you have bosses that are doing that. You're now, you just jumped all those ranks. You're at the top and you're getting people transferred because the, you were there for two days. Nobody knew who you were. And I, I don't know how many people got transferred. I think it was one, maybe two. But that's a guy on a power trip. Four. Wow. I have no respect for pe for someone that would do that. You know how many times I would go to work and they would, you know, they call me Lou and I'd say, my name is Paul. Call me Paul. Call me Paul. And they would say, but why? And I would say, that's, that's what my parents named me. That was the name they gave me. If you're at a detail or something and people don't know you and you're in uniform, they're going to, you know, refer to you as, as Lou. But I always made it a, a personal connection because I love the people that I work with. And we humanized each other the more personal you got. I never, ever stood behind my rank. And I have no respect for those who do. Sometimes a cop get, gets jammed up or sometimes you need to be a boss. And I get that. But just for, you know, for, for telling people that they need to call attention and transferring them when they don't is the same person who tells you to stand down when you're in the middle of a potential gunfight. And I have no respect for people that do that. You know, I agree with you. I, I always believed that you, you show everyone respect, but that doesn't mean you actually have to respect them. So I'm showing them respect by actually analyzing this situation because I care, and we all care for the, nature and nurture of what's going on with the cops and ultimately the effects it has on New York City. And I agree with, with John, and I agree with you on both hands in a sense. Like, yes, I do believe there's a part of it that their hearts are in the right place, that they want to help. They're still part of the, that are cops. But what you're saying, I believe, and I believe the reason is because what, what you're saying, Paul, is that their inadequacy and their incompetence overshadows their hearts being in the right place, which is why they have to lean on ego being egotistical and they have to lead on being bullies bullying a, a lieutenant in a precinct that did not call attention because you don't have the confidence to initiate your own systems in the police department to show your your your, your worth and, and and your importance as a leader your active role you, you said something earlier which i which i totally agree with right you could be the best cop in that situation but are you the one who, who should actually take an active role in dictating uh, the significance and dictate what should be done? And the answer is no, because being a good leader doesn't mean you have to be the strongest in the unit, in a unit, the, the, the smartest or the best. What a good leader does is know, is to know the capabilities of his people or her people and to know the strengths of them and to understand that sometimes you have to stand down and let them do their job. That's what good leaders do, is using their resources, knowing that, you know, I had plenty of people as a special operations lieutenant. I, you know, as we get, as we attain more rank, we get older. So obviously, when I was close to 40 years old as a special operations lieutenant, I had some young strappy guys in the early 20s. They're stronger than me. They have more physicality. I'm going to utilize that in certain scenarios that I shouldn't. That's what good leaders do, is use their people appropriately. And I think ultimately what this comes down to is incompetence. Incompetence and immaturity. Incompetence and immaturity. I mean, so what I'm taking from both of you guys is that if you were chief of the borough, you wouldn't have every command stand in front of a camera for roll call where you could see them and inspect them because you don't trust your sergeants, your lieutenants, 
or your commanding officers. But the NYPD does that. This is something that they do now. The, the borough commander needs to see the cops on camera so he knows. And, you know, so you can't trust a guy to get dressed. You can't trust the supervisor to ensure they're properly dressed. Are you going to trust a cop to make a decision out in the field? No, you're not. And, and the other thing is that, like, I don't care who the highest rank in that radio is, and we don't know who it is. I don't know if Kaz is a higher rank than, than, than Shell. I don't know if Shell's a higher rank than Kaz. I really don't know. I mean, it appears that, that Kaz on, on the news media, when he does a terrible job of speaking, that, he's, that he's, he's bowing down to Shell. But I don't know that. I don't know that for a fact. I don't know who outranks who on that. But it doesn't matter. I know who controls that scene. And it's the highest rank on that seat. And that is the one that should make the tactical decisions. Unless there was a different scenario, we have drones up. They're seeing something you're not seeing. Then I could understand it. Stand down. Exactly. Get the hell out of there. Then I could see it. They're in a, a project hallway or whatever hallway they're in. And you do not know what's going on. You do not know what they're facing at that second. You don't even know what happened. The majority of them on that scene don't even know it happened. You know, and 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 to me, it's just lack of immaturity and yes, lack of confidence and lack of realistic expectations for people on that scene, for whatever it may be, just un completely unrealistic expectations. And it starts the minute they walk out of the locker room to the to, to the most extreme situation. And you just see it spilling over the departments in turmoil. Everyone's leaving. And this is just a pure example of why. Yeah, I mean, we lost a lot this year. Um, you, you'd said that well, another thing that micromanaging does on a basic level, not just relative to law enforcement, is that it's almost demeaning. Uh, the people that need to grow as supervisors do not get that opportunity because they're going to doubt every decision they make. They're also going to rely on you, whoever's micromanaging, to call all the shots. Now, if you're not around, they may freeze, right? It paralyzes those who are normally in a position uh, to make a decision. I think a lot of this started with micromanaging when they installed, they made the cops put on body cameras because, I mean, first it was, look at how, and maybe you guys could take take us through the arc of how it started, right? Because first it was only meant for certain times and now they changed that, you know, it was supposed to protect the police and now they changed that where CCRB can go back as long as they want, generate a complaint, even though they don't have a complainant, even though the, the department hasn't had a problem with, with what, you, what you did, the body camera has been manipulated, but that's where the micromanaging began. And it, something like that crushes morale. And I'm still torn on body cameras because I think it could be a useful tool. But just like everything else, there, there are so many good ideas and there's so many things. We talked last time about the Patriot Act. There are so many good things on paper. But if it gets into the wrong hands where it's abused, where the people that are supposed to um, uh, implement these policies take advantage of it, then it's, it's rife with corruption. But a lot of the a lot of the micromanaging began with body cameras. What did you say that the can you back up, John, what you were saying about you have to stay on camera at roll call? So the precincts are all camera up now, in case you aren't aware. From the minute you walk into a precinct, you're on camera, you're on the desk, you're on a camera, you're in the muster room, you're on camera, wherever well, you who, are. Who's watching the camera? Well, anybody that wants it's on tape. No, no, you, you could actually watch it live. I, you could, if you're, you're in the department, you're a supervisor, you go on your phone, you could watch cameras and, and select precincts. You need the access code, but like, you know, like you need to ha be, have your code opened up. You like, basically, if you're a captain, you could probably see any precinct um, at any time, muster room, front of the precinct, back of the command, wherever you want to see. So the cameras are, com the, 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 the precincts are completely camered up. You could go on live at all times. So with the borough CO, I believe it was Manhattan South. I, I could be wrong. Um, what he wants them to do is all go into the muster room, make sure that they're in front of the camera, all of the cops and the supervisors, so that he could personally inspect them to make sure that they're that, to make sure that they're ready to go out for the day to patrol. 
It's bullshit. How, I mean, how much more demeaning can you get? <laughs> I don't know. I, don't know. See that, then, I mean, this is a little bit more demeaning, I think. Yeah. Well, this also involves safety where, you know, you, I hope it doesn't happen again. I hope that there might not be pushback, but I hope, you know, there's a little embarrassment going around. They realize they made a fool of themselves. If it happens again and a cop gets killed, God forbid, um, is, are they going to hang? Are they going to say, well, I did tell you to, to stand down and they're going to take the fall. I have a feeling that's going to be the cops on the scene as it usually is. And as it should be, but then you have to at least let them make the call, you know, let them make the decision. It's just common sense. I well, can't it's believe always, we're having this conversation. Well, well, we see it time and time again. It's always the cops that bear the responsibility. Daniel Pantaleo was sent to a scene. He bear the responsibility. Hugh Barry acted on his training. He bear the responsibility. We see time and time again. Juan Perez took down a mostly disturbed person that attacked him. He's bearing the responsibility of this court case right now. Cop after cop is bearing the responsibility. And again, I, I want to I want to reflect on what you said. You know, I I, I agree a hundred percent that micromanaging boxes cops in. It, it really deteriorates. It demeans them. Why it demeans them? Because we we deteriorate from their idea and their capabilities and ability to have creative thinking and actually think it's outside the box. We should we should the system should be in place that everyone is treated as if they're a leader, even a cop, because they can lead, a cop could potentially be leading a scene until a supervisor responds. So everyone has to have that ability to lead in any rank. But that's not what's happening here because the incompetence, and John said it, in immaturity, they, they, they go hand to hand, right? As you get more competent, more experienced in your role, you get more mature and understand that standing back is sometimes the better option. And, and on a small level, we could say, you know what, big deal. You know what, on uh, 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 small routine jobs. But in a situation like this, which is pretty much life or death, John and I had spoke about this offline. What does it do to the mindset of the person that's about to see the barrel of a gun in a hallway, who's now told to walk away from that hallway to call the issue, hearing, hearing assistant commissioner and the chief of patrol, John Shell on the radio, getting different messages, seeing what's going on. It creates total uh, confusion, and it also uh, contributes to more of what's called the fog of war. Because every time we're in a scene like that, we all we all get blurred by what's called the fog of war. Is that stress under duress? And they just made the situation much worse. And thank God we could talk about this now and actually laugh about it. Of some of the stuff they said, and we hear the egomaniacs. I mean, who's on the radio? Chief at the department's office. I mean, I get almost. Envision seeing with his chest puffing out. It, it's amazing. You can see, right? It's such a bully on the radio. And yet, when we see him on a conference, he can barely put two words together. He doesn't even know what his job is. Listen, New Yorkers should feel safe that, you know, uh, I'm sorry. My job basically is to. And, and then he's a big bully on the radio. You know, this was what, what makes him feel good. They gave him all this rank and this power, and he's not ready for it. He, he, he doesn't have the ability to be there. He's not mature. Honestly, it's children run this department, and it's sad to put lives at risk. And you ask would they take responsibility? Absolutely not. Look at this, this sergeant that threw a cooler at someone to stop the perpetrator when they were advised by Chief Shelt to take down anyone in, in pursuit. And where do we see any, any support? Absolutely not. They're left alone. They're left to hang. No, I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. I mean... I, I some I want to not pull. I don't know if you if you if you were on when this was happened, but whenever there's a job now where it's possibly a firearm involved, or it sounds like it could lead to where cops are going to pull out their firearms, it is commonplace now for duty captains, for borough chiefs, for sergeants, for lieutenants to come over the radio and say. All you have all units maintain firearms control. Firearms control. No. Central. Read out that message. Have all the units maintain firearms control. Now, I'm guilty of this myself. I'm guilty of it. I I don't I don't think I've ever did it on it like with bad intention. I, I don't I don't know that I actually ever even did it, to be honest with you. But I may have. I don't know. I don't remember if I ever did, but I've heard it so many times. But it just got me thinking, listening to this call. What does that mean? What does firearms control mean to you? You're on the job right there. 
there's a guy who you just either to fired a shot at you or whatever the case may be. What does maintain firearms control mean? That basically means you stand there, you get shot, you don't shoot first, hopefully the perp misses, and then you could shoot him. I heard in BMOC one time, this guy said that the job wants us to be a wooden soldier. And I didn't know what that meant. So we asked him to elaborate. And he says, they want us to show up every day, stand on the foot post, take all the incoming fire, but you're a wooden soldier. You can't respond. Your, your main job is to just get attacked. And the, one of the things I could see maybe they were worried about is contagious shooting. One guy fires. It happened with the Diallo case where they fired 41 shots. Most of the other cops don't really know why they're shooting, but you hear a round go off. You see your, your partner shoot. So before you know it, just a few seconds go by, you know, you have, you know, 30 rounds being fired. We all know that we hear that. I think it's in the patrol guide when it comes to EDPs, uh, maintain established firearms control. If you're on scene, that should mean you designate one shooter. I'll, I'll t you know, especially if you're not, if you don't keep the perp at the apex of a triangle, you don't want a circular firing squad where you're, you know, you got to keep him at the point so you don't hit each other in crossfire. So it could mean that. But in this situation, I think they're all just worried about, you know, making the news, you know, drawing heat to the police department. And basically, sh if you shoot him, you're on your own. That, that, that's the message I get from that. And it's just a it's just another way to. But again, that procedure could make sense in those examples that I just gave. But when it's put into the hands of someone who is doesn't have your best interest in, in mind, it's abused. Where you're basically co telling cops to don't do anything. You do anything, you're on your own. It's it's you know it's 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 a joke, but it's it's going to get a cop killed. I saw a video on YouTube. I don't know if it's a recent car stop. I forgot to check when it was uploaded. Where. Cops see, it was New York City cops too. They see a perp. He's reaching for the gun. The guy's in the passenger seat and he's reaching for the gun and they see the gun and he's reaching for the gun and the three cops jump on him and they're trying to get the gun away from this guy instead of just shooting him. All right, all right, don't move, all right, don't move. Leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it. On the floor, on the floor. Tina, leave it, Tina, leave it, Tina, leave it. Mommy, leave it. All right, put it down. Like that, put it down. Mommy. Put it down. Mommy. Yeah, put it down. You hear me? Put it down. Ma. Put it down. I love you. I'm putting it down. Hey, Let me put it down. Put it down. Let me choke Leave it. Leave it. Leave it. Put it down. Put it down. I'm put it down. Put it down. Put it down. Let me choke Okay, go down. I'm putting it down. Put it down. No. Let me choke my mom. No. 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 Here it comes. Here it comes. No. 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 No! No! Let go! Let go! Let go! I'm losing my grip! No! Let go! I'm losing my grip! Let go! Let go! Let go! Let go! Let go! Let go! Good job, guys! I agree that shooting should be the last resort. I've never had to take a life. I can't imagine what that must feel like. We all agree nobody should shoot anyone unless you absolutely have to. But it's gotten to a situation now where cops are so afraid to do police work and defend themselves that it's going to result in a cop getting killed. They've already taken nightsticks away. I don't know if that's true. I just heard that the other day. Curtis Lewell said it, that cops are now going to these riots without helmets and without nightsticks. They're demeaning you by telling you when you can and cannot engage. It started with the body cameras. And look at the business cards where you have to hand out. These people are surrounding you, giving you the finger, cursing at you. And you see the poor cop respond by saying, would you like a business card, sir? If that doesn't demean police, I don't know what does. They've made a joke of the police department. It angers me. It breaks my heart. I wish you guys could have been cops when... 
even the guys that came on before me were teaching me in the 70s. They would say in the 90s, oh, it's, it's a totally different world now. But back then, we had the support. But of course, there were no iPhones. And you know I refer to those guys as iPhone cowboys. I know that the law allows people to videotape police. But what they're doing now, when they're going up to cops and they're, they're pulling up your 50A, they're pulling up your, your, your records and they're saying, oh, look what you did. They made a cop cry. Oh, look, look, I'm sorry, but it says, guilty while on duty, wrongfully operated motor vehicle. She left, uh, wrongfully refused to take the breathalyzer test. And she left the scene, left wow. the scene. And you left the scene, you didn't want to take the breathalyzer? That's sad. You can't do that. You're breaking the law. How are you still a cop, though? She went to take, she went to take it to a rehab. No, no, but still, yeah, yeah, no, but does she have any losses? Yeah, 123,000 she made last year. Yeah, we got she got discipline. When did she start it? Uh, 2006. Okay. January 2020. We can't drive it in that parties, you know. You gotta have like a, a guy to drive you around, you know. We started in 2021. He made 58,700. That's it. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Oh my, but he wants to make fun of us. But meanwhile, that's all he made. <laughs> they went up to another cop in transit, like six months, standing there videotaping and all giving him the finger within just a, a foot from his face. There has to be somebody on the city council, somebody, whoever it is, that could pass something that says, you know what, you could videotape us, but you can't do what you're doing now. Look at this guy, yeah? White boy in the wrong fucking neighborhood. His partner, too. Two white boys in the wrong fucking neighborhood. Shut the fuck up. Fucking pussies. Fat boy, go to the gym, bro. You is fat. Get on the treadmill, bro. Get on the fucking treadmill. Get the fuck out of here. Fuck law and order. Fuck law and order. Fuck law and order. Why are you touching me, you bitch? <laughs> Why you touch me for? What's your badge number? 3103. Thank you. 3103. Yes, sir. Keep your hands to yourself. Fucking pussy. Yo, you lucky you got a fucking badge, yo. Beat your ass. We don't enforce anything. And there's no reason why cops should be harassed when it doesn't apply in any other job. You cannot harass anyone, but you're allowed to do it to law enforcement. And I blame the unions. And of course, the liberal people, the liberal politicians that are in charge you're nothing. You're just cops. And to them, you, you're expendable. I remember once we had a, uh, a fire in the 3-2 or the 3-0. And the 2 way cops had to sit on it for a while. And it was like, it was like the third week. And I remember telling my partner, I'm like, how long are they going to keep us here? Like, we're, we're out of command. We can't get a meal, right? Uh, it's on at midnight. And it's a poorly. It's just two fucking cops, poorly. Who cares? We're just cops. We're just cops. So it would be nice to see pro-law enforcement politicians get back into power. I don't see that happening, especially in New York. But the way the police are treated, the way they're demeaned and abused, I'm surprised more people aren't retiring. You know, uh, I, I just want to go back to what you said. I agree wholeheartedly with you. I think that when we talk about firearms control, I think there was a point in time in Paul, Correct me if I'm wrong. You came on the job in 1992. Am I right? Yes. All right. So you came on 92. Compared to now, it's it's a whole different ball of wax. And I think at the time, it was when they referred to firearms control, I think it meant tactical approach. Yes. Just as you said, designating the shooter, you know, being aware of your situation and making sure that the cops are safe. But here is the dichotomy where I think that things have completely changed and taken a complete 180. I think right now it's all about for the police department, the upper echelon, to have a virtue signaling. Who do they virtue signal to? Mayor Eric Adams, who is a super progressive. Not a moderate like everyone wants to say, 
super progressive, part of this woke leadership, and they're virtue signaling to him and to all these woke politicians in New York City. And what they what they say is buzzwords and buzz phrases. What's the most common buzzword we hear? De-escalation. And I think firearm control is a buzz phrase. And I think ultimately what they mean by firearm control is their virtual signaling. And you, you kind of summed it up here, Paul. And what they're saying is maintain firearms control. Basically what they're saying is do not shoot that weapon because if you do, that liability is on you. They're not worried about your safety. John highlighted it. What did John Shell say? And that just shows, right, in the heat of the moment, when his heart racing wanted to be involved, his instinct, right, because when you're in a situation and you're executing, you're going to what's going on in your subconscious. And his instinct was, did you fire at the perp? They weren't concerned about the well-being and safety of the cops. They were worried of exactly what John said. What are the optics going to be of this situation? And they wanted to stop it. We talk about this all the time. If a police officer is in a situation and he or she does not take action, in most cases, they are not penalized for it. However, this recent incident, was, which is kind of ironic, we saw this lieutenant was attacked. He was beaten, severely beaten, lucky to be alive. Eyewitness News obtained video of the attack that put Lieutenant Gypsy Pichardo in the hospital. He had to get eight stitches on his face. That lieutenant in uniform yesterday when he confronted two men involved in a knife fight on a number one train in the Bronx. Despite his injuries, he chased the attackers onto the platform. This is at the 238th Street station in Kingsbridge until officers arrested them. This is cell phone video of NYPD Lieutenant Gypsy Pichardo cornered and outnumbered four to one. The recording begins in the middle of the altercation. The 53-year-old lieutenant able to break free of the repeated jabs and blows and back out onto the platform. But there's one part of the video that remains unclear at the beginning when Pichardo is being overpowered by the suspects and another officer is seen standing a few feet back. The cop did not intervene and he, and he was ultimately suspended. But in most cases, there's no retribution for a cop from standing down. Usually what they do is they clap, they say great job. He or she showed an amazing amount of strength because that's what they want. They do not want you to fire your weapon and they do not want you to take action. And that's part of the reason why they micromanage also to keep the cops suppressed so that they do not take action. So I think firearm control has come down to a buzz phrase and what it means is do not shoot. That's what I think it means. Yeah. No, ma maintain firearms control. I think, I honestly think they, they put it over the radio as a CYA. I think supervisors put it over the radio. I didn't tell them to shoot. I think that's what's going on in their subconscious. I think that, and again, this is just my guess because we've never been told what it is. And, and, and both of you have great points on what it is, but we've never been trained on why that is and why this came to be and why this helps anybody. What does firearms control, maintain firearms control mean? That was Paul Manicone's term. That was Eric Dim's term. This is going to be John McCarry's term. It's not like whoever else is, says it, that's, it, it is because there's, we don't know what it means. You know, I think in my head, oh, it's, it's trying to snap you out of the, uh, to, to, you know, trying to stop you out of having tunnel vision, make sure you understand the, the uh, reality of the circumstances. But I really think it sits you there and it leaves you guessing, what the fuck should I do? What is firearm control? What is me firearm control? Do I shoot? Do I not shoot? Do I, what, what does maintain firearms control mean? I don't know. And it's just one of those things. And just, and just, you know, to, to just about what you were talking about with cops being harassed with their 50A. I mean, you got this kid, uh, whatever his name is, famous Richard. He goes around with his finger. Is that your pipe? Yeah. David, is that your pipe? Let me see your pipe, King David. I would snap his finger the minute he came next to me. Literally break his finger. On oh, King Day, why you just walk up on me like that, shorty? What's wrong with you? You want me to take your bike? On oh, King Day, you want me to take your bike? This kid is YouTube famous. He's got hundreds of thousands of followers on YouTube. There is not one directive on the New York City Police Department on how to deal with him. There are laws on the books, harassment of a police officer. There are laws, harassment. There are numerous laws that that kid is violating. He's acting disorderly. He's acting violent and tumultuous. I'm going to take your pipe. He's saying he's going to take your gun. He's either going to take your gun or he's going to grab something 
on your private parts. It's one or the other. And there is zero direction from the New York City Police Department on what that on what that kid to do. Complete, utter, utter incompetence. And then spin it to the to the to the to the muster room or or the desk area where they're saying no, no one could come in here and film, even though you're on film every second of the thing, even though you're wearing a body camera, they're telling you don't film, even though it, a judge already said it violates First Amendment rights, that it's ridiculous, and it clearly does. I mean, any per- rational person could tell that it does. And the jobs, what is the job telling them now? No, lock those people up that come in, and uh, uh, we, 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 we just fought that. And they're all going to be left out on their own. And again, you're right. Whose fault is it at the end of the day? The unions, because they're just like this. Yes, Chief. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Here you go. Here's your fresh water right for you. They have zero direction on telling you what to do. It's an embarrassment. And Lou, if you're listening to this, I want to know why I'm not getting emails. $500 I paid to be a lifetime member, and I don't get any LBA emails. I want, I'd want. i love to know why. You must, you, mentioned, you, must have paid your membership. you must have paid your membership for me because I didn't pay. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted the emails. I wanted to go to the meetings. I never got them. You want to go to the picnic? I want to go to everything. Uh, you mentioned videotaping inside precincts. Is that so? The the PD is telling you one thing, and the and the judge is telling basically our law department something else. Is that is that right? They're saying that. So here's where I stand with it, and I think we disagree, which is great because it always makes for good footage. Um, I don't think you should be filming in front of, in, in a police precinct. Now, who am I? I'm just a cop. It does it doesn't matter. We have to follow the law. What's that? Your first amendment, right? Right. So I have, I'm my own personal feeling, and this is why. Uh, when I was in SNU, we had a base, uh, 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 an office down in the hole, and when people would call, we'd answer the phone, "Hello," and the captain. A couple of times, the captain called me, and I'd say, "Hello," and he said, "Paul, that's not the proper way to answer the phone." And I said, "Well, a lot of CIs have our SNU office number." And if they find the number of one of our CIs, I don't want this guy getting killed because they found out when they call that number, this guy's talking to the cops. We had CIs meet us a lot. Some of them gave very good information that led to great warrants and we got a lot of stuff. And some of it, you know, ended, ended up flat. I don't think it's, it's a good idea to have some idiot who's got nothing better to do and wants to do nothing than antagonize police and poke the bear to come in and videotape what's going on inside a precinct for that reason, for CIs, but also think about domestic violence victims. Think about people who are in abusive relationships who finally get the courage to go meet with a domestic violence officer or go and make a report to the police department. Now, now this, you know, this girl sitting in the one to four room and the next thing you know, her abusive husband sees her on YouTube. Babe, what were you doing in the precinct? What, you told me you were at work. What are you doing at the priest? So I think, I think once you get into the lobby, that's it. You shouldn't have a camera there. It doesn't matter what I think. Really, it doesn't matter what any of us think. Uh, it's unfortunate that they're they're not giving clear uh, rules. That the judge is saying one thing and and the job is saying another. But I'm totally against that. I wish that. Listen, if we can't get them to stop harassing the police the way they're doing now. Filming inside a precinct is way down on that list of things that need to be addressed. But I saw those videos where he puts the finger in the cop's face. I, I'm telling you now, I would be, I would be, I would probably be fired. And it's not because I'm a tough guy. It's just that we, we, you know, we, we, of course we had no video cameras, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't have done that. There's no reason to do that unless you want to attack uh, unless you want to demean the cops. And that's what's been allowed to happen. You take away their nightsticks, you put video cameras on them, you force them to hand out business cards. There's so many other things, like you guys say all the time, that are way more important than the contract. It's great that they're making more money. They deserve to make more money, especially when you have to deal with all this shit. One of the things I used to say and all the cops used to say is, you're working so, you're working so hard. When I came on, I started at 28000 a year. Top pay after five years was $44,000. And if you were a captain, you were making under 100 and you worked your ass off. 
I remember my captain studying for Comstat. He studied for 32 hours straight, didn't sleep. And we always said, you know, if you were like the CEO of Home Depot, if you were the CEO, CEO of a major corporation, they got to go and give presentations, but you know what? They're making millions and millions of dollars. So you're doing it for almost basically for free. If, if it comes out to an hourly basis, you're not getting overtime. So I do think that the, the contract was important, but it was one of the many steps. All of these other things, CCRB, Eric, right? I, I know that. <laughs> I know you perk up when I but say I can that. Tell you, I can tell you if that guy pointed his finger at me, I'd be getting another CCRB. Oh, King David, where your pipe at? Where your pipe at? Let me see that pipe. That pipe, that pipe on your hill. Go, 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 go. You don't know who I am? No. They call me Mr. Take Your Pipe. I be going around taking y'all pipes. That pipe on your hip? Can I see your, can I see your pipe? When you allow this atmosphere and this environment of you could do anything. Watch this, babe. Watch this, guys. We could do anything we want to this cop, and he's not going to fight back. There's something wrong with you, and I can guarantee every one of these people has a criminal history. Yeah, but those are people that should have been arrested. These are people that there should be procedures in place that the cops should feel empowered, but instead they feel exactly emasculated because of the incompetence. And just to back up on on the, the 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 precinct, you're walking into a precinct, you're on camera, you're on body camera, you're in a public area of the precinct, a domestic violence victim. And a CI should be nowhere around either of those things where they're going to be on camera. And the third thing, if I walk in there with a little pinhole camera on my thing, and you didn't know I, I cameraed the whole thing. Now, if you're disorderly, you should get arrested. You come in there, you interfere in police operations. I don't care if you're doing this or you're not doing that. You should get arrested. And that this whole thing stems from the emasculation of the NYPD where yes. Got abused for forty five minutes and didn't affect an arrest when it should have been arrested. Now the the decision was, well, let's just make it let's just make it illegal to film in here. Guess what? It's a public facility. Doesn't matter like what the police department thinks about it or what anyone thinks about it. I put a, a hidden camera on myself. I go in. I film everything in the public areas. I put it on YouTube. What crime did I commit? Nothing. Well, that the, I don't I'm I don't know what crime that is, but that's what I'm saying. The no difference is when you're. Exactly. That, that's this is why it says it's kind of a moot point because it doesn't matter what we think. But when you're talking about being on camera, if you're on the desk or cops are wearing the camera, that's not that should not normally be released to the public unless something happens. I'm worried about people that finally have the courage to go in and speak to the police, and now they're going to be outed by a coworker, a neighbor, or an abusive spouse, and, and it what will if make. I have a hidden camera. I committed no crime. And I put you on YouTube. I committed zero crime. There's nothing that could be done to well, me. You're, well, you're, hold on. You're hiding it, assuming there's a policy in place, meaning that you can't film in there, right? These guys are going in like this because th it's just like they do to cops on the streets. And I'm, look, filming, do to I'm filming hidden or I'm filming. What's the doubt? I'm filming. Because if they make it, if they make it illegal, it would, you'd have no choice but to hide it because then you'd be arrested, right? That, the problem well, I have is... You're, I'm committing the same act. I'm no, I know. The same act. <laughs> I know. Well, if, if if they're allowed to do it, it doesn't matter if they come with the, come in with their phone. They, uh, like, it's illegal to do drugs. People are still doing them. If you say it's illegal to come in and film at a precinct, yeah, people are still going to get around it, just like they get around of, uh, you know, doing well, drugs and committing robberies. Well, my whole point is, it's complete incompetence. It's your First Amendment right. These This kid is going in. Winning lawsuit after lawsuit, the judge is telling the NYPD and every other facility across America that this kid goes in that this is your First Amendment right. People could go in there and film. This is a courts are telling them in every state in this country, they're telling them go in. But what's the NYPD saying? Oh, you know what? We appealed that decision. So keep continuing to arrest all these people. And at the end of the day, who suffers? You get, a, you get a, a, a new most complaint cop and you get someone else hung out to dry. And that's, and that's the thing is like the things that they need to hone down on and make procedures, they don't. And the shit that they should stay away from, they want to be the police on. It's the stupidest, stupidest thing ever. 
It's stupid. Well, that's the, I like to break yeah. this down. It, is, I like to break this down. There's a lot of important stuff here. First, you said something I think is really important. We can reflect on. You said, uh, Paul, that the public doesn't have access to this camera footage, but they actually do, right? We're under the assumption, right? Just, just it's just the police department watching. But the civilian complaint review board, which I consider the public, because they're giving out all rhetoric about anti-police, but the public has access to all the camera footage. In the in, in the precinct, and they can view it at any time. They can self initiate a case for anything. And I think, well, John, what, what I think what you're trying to say, and, and I agree with you because we, we talked about this. It doesn't matter if the camera is concealed or not. At this point, right now, it's not our job to interpret the law. We execute it. The law is it for, it's your First Amendment right for them to, to film. I, I I agree with you. I don't think they're filming for any purpose other than antagonizing the police. Do you have reasonable articulable suspicion that I'm committing a crime, sir? Again, I'm telling you, I don't want any I'm issues with you. I don't want any issues this with you either, this Lieutenant. This I'm, is the deal. I told you. I understand that you have an unconstitutional every, policy here. I have every right to film outside. I have every right to film inside if I wanted to. Maybe I'm just holding the so, camera up, you okay. know, my phone up if just because you, I want to. If you are to. filming, I'm going to ask that you leave. Okay. I don't want to answer will, any questions. Again, I'm not asking you. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not asking you any questions. Okay, great. I'm just Perfect. telling you. Are you recording, sir? I don't answer questions. Now I'm going to now I'm going to file a formal complaint against okay. yourself and this officer because you're assuming that I am recording totally without any sort okay, of proof we will, we will, that I'm recording. You have no totally proof. Fine. If someone wants to film, go ahead, film all day. You want to waste your time? I don't even understand why he acknowledges people. Now, if the police department continues a lawsuit and they have the law overturned, that's a different story. But right now, their policy contradicts law and ultimately puts the cop in vulnerability and culpability for civil liability. That's where I have the problem, because some young rookie that doesn't understand the nomenclature of the patrol guide is going to act on his emotions in this particular thing. Because someone is a nuisance filming, and now they're the they're the one that gets substantiated CCRB, gets the discipline matrix we weaponized against them, against them, gets a civil liability. They're not indemnified, which we maybe just spoke about a prior podcast. Maybe they get arrested. Maybe they get arrested. They even arrested. So I mean, well, I, can, I, I, I agree. It's it's a horrible way to it's a horrible way to police. It's a horrible way to live. I mean, if you compare 1992 to policing now, these guys the only time that they're working and they're not on camera is in the bathroom. That's the only time these guys have absolutely no privacy. It's not even there too. And they're actually on camera there too because it came out that the body cameras live always, even when it's off. Yeah, and you brought up a point that if if a woman's um, you know, pumping breast milk and or breastfeeding. Yeah. She has to worry about where she keeps her camera too. L so let me ask you your opinion on this. The job is telling you, uh, don't let them film. The judge and the law is saying uh, they have a right to film. If you're letting someone film because it's the law, will that will that cop get jammed up because the job is telling him if, if something makes goes viral on YouTube. Are they going to pull out the procedure and jam up this cop and say, look, section, you know, one of those. Absolutely. And I'll tell you right now. Absolutely. And I'll tell you right now. I'll tell you right now. And I'll give you, I'll give you the correlation to that. John Shell, inadequate leadership of the police department is in a position. Chief Patrol is telling the police officers to pursue all suspects foot and in a car. These fleeing suspects, they're turning into car crashes, people are dying, and these cops are going to face potentially imprisonment eventually. A fiery crash. Kills one woman and puts the driver in the hospital. And now we're learning more about the moments before the Lamborghini crashed and burst into flames in Inwood. Investigators say Monday night, a 22-year-old man in a rented Lamborghini with a female passenger ran a red light in Inwood. When officers pulled the driver over and got out of their car, the Lamborghini took off and a pursuit began. After a few blocks and a few turns, the driver hit another car seen in the video and the Lamborghini lost control, slamming into an above ground one train subway pillar. As the car is on fire, the driver rescued, but inside a 21 year old woman didn't make it out alive. Let me give a rhetorical situation. And I think this is a scenario where filming should be outlawed and then acted upon by the police department, right? If someone is filming 
That's their First Amendment right. But they're not impeding on police department business, on operations flowing. Let them film all day. But if the law line on order decided to come in with a with 10 person camera crew and set up 10 tripods and no one could come in and there's no intake and everything's being impeded and we can't have a flow of traffic for the police department, police officers going to work and we can't have an intake of people coming in to make complaints. Now, that's where I, I believe the videotaping and filming should be acted upon. And I'm still, not charging, that- it. I'm still not charging. Right, right, right. I'm charging it with OGA. <laughs> I'm charging and trust other different things. Failure to obey a lawful order, disorderly conduct. I'm still not charging him with the filming. You know? Correct. I'm, I'm just trying to say a scenario where the filming would be a problem. But again, you're right. Because the charge is not going to be for filming. You're going to ask these people to leave. They're going to tell you, you know, go screw yourself. And now we have to get them to move. And if they don't, it's ultimately trespass. So again, it, no one's getting charged with video. You're right. You know, I think... I think when I was when I first made super when I made lieutenant, they asked the um, newly promoted lieutenants to go in and speak to the newly promoted sergeants. And one of the one of the things I said to them is, just remember, not everybody's like you. Meaning, if you came into work every every morning late and you were out partying and you got a drinking problem, don't necessarily think that the reason why the cops in your squad are coming in under those same circumstances. They could have a sick child or a sick parent at home. They could be sick, whatever. And on the other end of that is just because you walk up to a bag of money and you say, okay, no problem, I'm going to vouch for this, don't automatically assume that that person will have the same integrity that you did. I think when it comes to police work, we assume that people will uh, are a lot like us. We make the same mistake. Tucker Carlson had a uh, a segment on where he was talking about, you know, Antifa harassing people going to church for not wearing their masks, and they knocked over all the stuff, you know. And he said, just because it's not a uh, a crime doesn't mean it, it's smart to do this. He said, it might not be a crime to curse at nuns on their way to church, but common sense means, and common decency and courtesy means you shouldn't do it. I cannot help thinking that, and I still make that same mistake today, why it takes a special person to go over to a cop, sometimes with five or six of his friends, and give them the finger and get that close to them. When I was younger... We feared cops. I remember the, the worst thing we did was hang out on the corner and drink. And we were hanging out uh, on Metropolitan Avenue in the 104. It was probably like 18 or 19. Cops came by and oh, hide the beer, hide the beer. The cops coming, right? And one of, one of my friends started walking away. And he said, uh, you in the blue, stop. And he kept walking because he had a beer. He didn't have anything bad. He had a beer, but we were underage, right? And then he goes over the PA and he goes, if I got to get out of this car, I'm going to grab you by the fucking throat. And we all froze. <laughs> you better, you better stop. You better stop. You better. There was a fear of police. And then it went to community policing where they want you to interact with the people on your beat. They want you to get to know the people you're policing, which I think is a good thing. And as usual, it went too far in the other direction. And now you, there's, There's no fear whatsoever. And I'm not even talking about the people that fight the police when you're trying to make an arrest. Like you saw all these terrible videos where it's no big deal. I'll just fight the cop. But they're going out and they're looking to provoke you where it's allowed, it's acceptable, and it's not allowed in any other profession. You cannot videotape your CPA or your doctor or your teachers. You can't. You can't do this. It's only allowed with police officers, and I get that they have a right to do it, but for some reason, the people that want to do this are usually the ones that are out to make trouble. I guess they get off on it. It makes them feel powerful, but I, I just wish that we... But the reason why... that there's, there's many reasons for this, but I think the most obvious one is there's no consequences for anything. L- you know, look at what they just did at the Christmas tree lighting. They know. They know you get... There's no consequences for shoplifting. 
There's no consequences for, you know, committing robberies and all these people are being let out with all this bail reform nonsense. And, and look at how bad it's gotten when you see police abused. You got a partner, yeah. That's sexy. I like the fact that you got a partner. You 60 credit bitch, you're dirty. 2354 for this dirty motherfucker. Get the fuck out the fucking hood, bitch. And take it with you. Even the people don't want to see you here, bitch. Get the fuck out. Move! You can relate, right? You can relate. Eat this bitch right now. Eat this for life right now, asshole. Woman beat up. You're quick to get home, right? Like you done with your officer right next to you. You're quick to go home and beat your wife. You piece of shit. Nah, 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 nah. Nah, 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 nah. Hey, hey, hey. Nah. Everyone watching these videos wants to jump through the screen and, and attack this guy for what he's doing. But instead, what happens in today's society? They become famous. And they get interviews and they get likes and they get clicks and they get... You know, their channels are probably, you know, more watched than mine. Uh, and it's just, it, it again, doesn't make it illegal. I just hope that they did. I wish that they wouldn't do it. And they're like John says, OGA, uh, obstructing governmental administration, disorderly conduct. There are laws on the books. Just collar him. Just collar him. And I don't, He's coming in being disruptive. He should be. No, I'm not even talking about in the precinct. I'm talking about there was a cop that was trying to get to his car, and this guy was just like, you know, cutting him off on the sidewalk and walking around him and circling him and giving him the finger and screaming at him. That's what they do, pussy. That's what they do, nigga. Do something. Do something, nigga. That's the time it is. Just the time it is, nigga. I make them nigga pack your dumb ass up. I'm gonna make them pack you up, nigga. Watch it. Watch it. Pussy. That's right. That's right, nigga. Don't cut him, nigga. It's that time, nigga. It's that time, pussy. Let that white man get away. Let the white man walk out the door. And they're going to choke that one of yours. Huh? Oh, he ain't one of yours, right? He ain't one of yours, but that white man wasn't even. He wasn't blue. No, he just he followed wasn't orders, blue. dog. That's he all wasn't he blue, does. nigga. He wasn't blue. If you're going to do something for black people, at least get the killer, nigga. If you're going to do something for black people, get the killer, nigga. Get the killer. Yo. Yo, let him walk in the gate. Hey, you ain't mad, nigga. Hey, do you feel like an idiot with that shit on? Because the blood is still on your hands, pussy. Y'all let him walk out the door, pussy. Y'all let him walk out the door, nigga. Yeah. That's harassment. At that point, that's right. He's got to get collared. And a lot of people say, well, that'll just make the situation worse. I think the exact opposite. I think the sooner you you squash something, you prevent it from getting out of hand and and I I you know, I give anything to go back to that method of policing because it kept Cop safer and it kept the citizen safer. Well, it could still be there. And, and that's the thing. The micromanagement is for the stupidest things because these people that are leading the New York City Police Department currently are completely incompetent, completely in over their heads, and completely don't care about the rank and file or the betterment of New York City. I mean, again, like everyone blames bail reform. Everyone blames New York City Council. Everyone blames all this stuff. Right. What are they worried about? They're worried about that inspections went into a command and some guy didn't have his shoe signed. That should be a non-issue. That should be you tell the CEO, make sure you guys do that again. Or we're going to send inspections there. They're going to get have it. That shouldn't be. Oh, this is where we're going to go in and micromanage. It shouldn't be. Oh, we're going to do this. Or, you know, the guy's filming in the in, in the one, two, four room. You know, make sure you put over the radio, maintain firearm control. Make sure one PP has something over there. It shouldn't be any of that. But you have this kid, King David, running around here and not one thing is said. I don't care what the DA does. That kid should be arrested every time he does it. So I, why, why do you think that he isn't? What do you it's got to be. It, obvious, why do you think he's not? Like, like, the, the, you don't think that they're well aware of, of, of this kid going out every day and making these videos? Of course they are. Why that he's not? Because the police department doesn't want him to be arrested because it won't look good. That's, not, that's what that's the leadership it's issue. It's that's exactly right. And it won't look good if he gets if the if he gets if he gets rowdy and the fight ensues. It won't look good. It's a minor crime, but it's the same thing. Do you think that 
if he got arrested every time he did that, one another iPhone cowboy would come into the, the precinct feeling bold enough to act the same way this kid does? No, but they only do because we allow that. The shoplifting, the same thing. I don't care what the DA does. We're not even locking up shoplifters anymore. The stores stop calling because they're like, when the cops come, yes. they don't do anything anymore. I hear every day from somebody in New York City telling me, the cop was here and they told me they can't do anything because the DA doesn't prosecute. I Honestly, you should be fired. If you ever tell any anybody that called 911, you can't do anything because the DA doesn't prosecute, you should be fired. There is no need for you. Get out of here. I didn't need you to respond here. I didn't need you to waste the city's gas. I didn't need you to be in the uniform. You did nothing today. You shouldn't get made. But that's what we're doing. And it all stems from the leadership. I don't care about the past. Yes. yes. I don't care. The micromanagement for the dumbest, dumbest things. And then they want to hear themselves on the radio in a situation like that where they're going to get somebody killed. It's awful. It's so bad. It's not even funny. And that's why they hate this show. And I don't really care because it's the truth. Well, you know what it comes down to? There is absolutely zero leadership. There is no leadership. And I agree. Right. I agree with everything that's said here. Absolutely. First of all, there is absolutely no vision. There's no guidance. There should be a specific directive. And John Shell, we love to get this phony, tough guy talk. You know, we won't tolerate this anymore. I always hear this constantly. We don't tolerate this. I even heard Tariq Shepard, who has now been elevated high up uh, on the job, who came from DCPI. But what rank is he now? And he's a, he's a, he's a commissioner, John. Commissioner. Right. Commissioner. I, I heard it. I heard him say he was interviewed on TV. They asked him about the lieutenant where his face got bashed in and, alt and almost lost his life. He asked me, he's lucky to be alive. He said, we're not going to tolerate this anymore. Again, buzzwords, de-escalation, buzz brains, uh, firearms control. We won't tolerate this anymore. But how, how will we not tolerate this anymore? They should be telling the cops exactly that. You do not work for the DA's office. You work for the New York City Police Department. You have our support. If famous Richard gets in your face and he threatens to grab your pipe, you put him in handcuffs. And if he chooses and you react on, on his physical confrontation and the civilian complaint review board comes after you, we will step in and we will back you. And then the unions, every one of them should step in and say, we will have your support and we will back you financially. But that's not what we're hearing. There's absolutely no guidance and there's no leadership and the cops are left holding the bed, the bag, and they're the ones holding the liability. And this fake tough guy talk by these incompetent leaders, they're just bullies and they just and they they don't care. They want to be involved in something where they're, they're far away. But something that's important like this for the safety of the cops, they don't care. Zero leadership. I have a, I have a problem with them. They should be stepping in right now and say they should actually go on TV. John Shell should do that. He loves this fake tough guy talk. John Shell should say, famous Richard, I'm giving you a message. My cops have been informed that if you encounter any of my cops and you get in their personal space and you threaten to grab their pipe, which is their gun, you will be in handcuffs. And if you choose to fight, well, then what happens to you was your choice. Oh, King Davis, shorty. They call me Mr. Take Your Pipe. You see that pipe? Yeah, I'm the one that be going around taking y'all pipes off y'all hips. That's why I want to hear from this phony tough guy talk. And, you know, this is the last guy that should be given barking orders about maintaining firearms control when he admits to accidentally shooting a subject, a, an adversary. There's no accidents when it comes to holding your firearm. I learned in the Marine Corps, keep your finger off the trigger until you attend the fire. Why? Because you could be startled and you could pull that trigger. So he failed and he messed up. He's the last guy that should be barking those orders. We have incompetence at the top of the job. I just put out a tweet recently and I compared myself, John McCarry, and Sal to Jeffrey Madry, John Shell, and Kaz Daughtry. And all three of them have far worse records than we do. They should not be in the place that they are. Well, like John was saying, it doesn't, you know, people are complaining about the community count or the city council and the DAs and Bell. I think we all agree the biggest problem, at least in the New York City Police Department, is a lack of leadership. And listen, we had yeah. protesters with 41 shots. They closed down the whole Brooklyn Bridge. We knew the DA was going to DP all of it. Some were given DATs, but for the most part, most of the most of the charges with this fist. We still locked them up. We commandeered buses and we had 
we locked up hundreds of people because that's what you're supposed to do. So I don't agree that the cops should try to shit can it. I do think that this is just a, if you look at how the New York City cop, you talk about low morale when it comes to micromanaging. I never, the, the public might, and you guys might disagree with me and that's fine, but the public might think, the civilians might think, you know, when you go to work, you have to realize you might not come home when you're a cop. I never feared getting killed. The only time that situations where I thought something was going to happen, your adrenaline is pumping so much that you think about it later and maybe you start to shake, right? Because you say, oh shit, I almost, you know, a round went by my head. I almost, I could have, I could have bought it. But for the most part, I believe the struggles uh, uh, that uh, affect a New York City cop today have always come from within. That was what I dealt with when I was on a job. You were worried about getting jammed up. You're worried about CCRB, Department Advocates Office, IAB, your sergeant, your lieutenant, your CEO. Now you got these guys on the radio telling you how to handle the job when they're, when they're not there. The body camera, the business cards, these, these perps not getting arrested for you know standing an inch within a, a couple of inches of your face and giving you the finger. There is so many different ways to demoralize our police department. They have been gelded. The contract does not make up for it. I wish they would focus on the other things that, that are so much more important. Uh, I think it was a step in the right direction, but somewhere, somebody has to come out and say like, when I don't like Bratton now because he was woke, but when he was, because he's woke, but pre-woke, he came on the job when he came, became our commissioner and Giuliani became mayor. He said, I want cops, not social workers. So put aside bail reform, put aside raise the age, and put aside the legislation that New York City Council tries to push constantly. Do you believe that if the unions and the upper echelon sat in a room together and said, listen, we're going to turn crime around as best as we could today, here's how we're going to do it. Do you believe that this, this would work? By saying the upper echelon is going to tell the cops and the public that we have, the cops have our full support and they are going to start making arrest immediately at any protest where any violation is acted on or any violation takes place immediately. And then if the civilian complaint review board attacks the police officers for doing their job, the union will step in and have their support financially, immediately, right away, and that the cops and the, and the cops will have the full support to do their job. And if they came out and said, we don't care if these things do not get prosecuted, we'll just arrest someone 100 times if we have to, and the unions will flip the bill every time. Do you believe that that could turn the city around? John? Absolutely. 1,000%. I think we're on 33 nights in a row in New York City where there's major, I don't even want to call them protests, there's major interruptions in, in vehicular and pedestrian traffic, in tourism, in events, in cultural events. There's major disruptions by anarchists, Antifa, BLM, and mixed in, they have some young Palestinian kids. The majority of people there don't even know. Ask them what which river, what sea do you want free? They won't be able to answer you. Right. They couldn't point out Palestine on a map. They have no idea what they're talking about. This is complete lawlessness, and it's being allowed by the New York City Police Department. Eric Adams is an incompetent, corrupt individual. He will be indicted. I don't know for a fact, but he thinks he's going to be, or else he wouldn't be trying to raise a million dollars right now. And anyone that thinks that he's not going to get indicted, then what is he raising a million dollars for? for his campaign. He believes he's being indicted. And that's why I'm saying Eric Adams was never a cop, so he doesn't know any better. He put uh, Caban in, who was a mess of a cop and was now the police commissioner. He's empty suit. He's not doing anything. He's taking photos. He's nowhere to be found. Same thing for Tanya Cancilla. The only two guys that are getting in the mix, actually three of them, are Kemper, uh, Shell, and Kaz. And they have been, and they are completely politicized, and we've seen it. We've seen it. You know, you bring up Bratton, and and yes, we've seen how he was woke at the end, 
and he's woke now and he's a, you know, he's a progressive, but it was easy for him. Right. So maybe, you know, like even I, you know, I, I, I like, I like all the commissioners prior. Right. But it was easier for them. They had a different mayor. They didn't work for these progressives. So I don't know who those guys would have been either, but I know who these guys are now and they're following the progressive tone. You could shift New York city in a week and you know how you do it. It's very simple. Enforce everything no tolerance, bring them to an arrest area where there's one computer and let them wait until they get processed over and over again. Forget this whole four hours out the window. Forget all this other stuff, all these minor stupid things. They don't, they don't, they don't abide by law, but they're worried about all these stupid procedures and let the lawsuits come anyway, because they're coming anyway. It doesn't even matter. Start holding people accountable and let people know you're the New York City Police Department and this won't be tolerated. But what we're seeing now is everything's tolerated. And that's why it's happening. They could change it overnight, but they're not going to because they don't have the spine. And and they've, they've exhibited that for the last three years, all of them. What what four hours are you talking about? Arrests? I'm being out of the four hours. Out of the Wait, what? say that again? You heard me. Per Wait, you hours. have to be... You only have four hours to process an arrest. Four hours. And what happens if it? What happens if? I don't know. You're gonna get a CD. We're gonna write. Oh, no, but it's serious. Oh yeah. <laughs> what if it's like a homicide or? or uh, all right. We we don't. Oh, those things don't matter. Four hours. <laughs> so what? Last time we spoke about, um, I think the vehicle pursuits, uh, and we talked about Shell, and I asked you guys, what would it take? For you to get on board with Chief Shell. And I think Eric uh, had said, you know what it would take? It would take all of the DAs of every borough. It would take the mayor. It would take the police commissioner. It would take the city council to all get together and say, we're going to stop this. I would like to see a coalition with the commissioner, the mayor, Philip Banks, the real police commissioner, chief of department, the chief of patrol, New York City Council, CCRB. The five borough DAs standing together and every one of them saying, we will not tolerate this anymore. We are going to take the streets back. We will not prosecute our cops for, for, uh, and substantiate civilian complaints and hold them back from doing their job. We, the New York City Council, are removing the diaphragm law. We, the five borough DAs, will not pursue police officers to, to enhance our careers. We, the New York City Police Department leadership, are getting together and we're making a coalition to take the streets back. That, I think, is where it needs to start. And we're going to clean up this place and uh, we're not going to allow our cops to be abused and we're actually going to enforce the law. So I agree with that. And, and I do believe that you need more than just the unions because I was talking about morale and how these poor cops are being um, gelded and how you know, with the camera and everything else. But the other thing that I think affects it is those two cops that beat up that lieutenant, they were released without bail. That's that's disgusting. And that also not only affects the police, but it affects the public because when when people are attacked or they're victimized, real victims, not the shit that we say see today where everyone's a victim, it has a tremendous psychological effect on them. And when the public sees that the police are being victimized, when they're spray painting our RMPs and setting them on fire or fist fighting with the cops, it affects the public because there's no one that comes after us. The cops don't call the military if the shit hits the fan. It's just us. And when you're showing up and you're getting embarrassed, humiliated, abused, what does that tell the public? A crowd in Harlem throws buckets and pours water on officers in the middle of making an arrest. In a separate incident, another video shows it happening again. Bystanders laugh and record videos, but no one helps. Yo, they violated them! They violated them! No, they violated them! Oh, they not stopping! That affects the public, too. And I think an another problem that we have is... The people that are put in charge, Eric, CCRB did not have nearly the power 
that they have today. And I heard on the last pod, on the last uh, podcast about nepotism, and I didn't know this, but I think I heard you say that you never got in trouble with the police department. It was just CCRB. That's absolutely correct. Okay, so never. this this is this is this blows my mind because. John, when you were when you went on and you made that uh, uh, phone call to CCRB, and the guy listened to you, and then when you when your four minutes were up, he, you could see the rage he had when he started saying this guy was shot. I don't know how many times in 112 seconds. It's important to have a few other facts that Lieutenant Din left out of his description of what happened on that day with Mr. Trawick. They banged open the door. And Mr. Trawick is in his studio apartment cooking and holding a knife. Mr. Trawick goes to turn down his music. It's so confrontational. It's so dangerous. He goes to turn down his music so he can speak to the officers. And in less than 112 seconds, Officer Thompson, despite Officer Davis physically trying to keep him from shooting Mr. Trawick, Officer Thompson tases him and shoots him four times. Not once, not twice, not three times, four times. Then they close the door and let him bleed to death. The guy hates police. And the problem with the CCRB, the Civilian Complaint Review Board, is not just that they're civilians, but they hate cops. They hate cops. Maybe you could find one or two that has common sense, but I, I doubt there's very few pro cop people in, in that agency. And I would ask you in any Joe Fox. Field, what's that? Joe Fox, he's a police designee. He's on the Savannah yeah. Player Review Board. He takes pictures with cops. Are. Right. He takes pictures with cops. He's a nice guy. He's a nice guy. Right. But nice he doesn't guy. say a word. Well, coward. The problem is that you can't have people that hate something or someone being charged of it. And it's not just with the police department. If you hate your neighbor and you were hired to mow his lawn, would you do a good job? Of course not, because you hate the guy, right? Oh, so, but boy, you're not answering the question. What, 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 what yeah. am I not answering? You're not answering the question. Eric asked you, do you think Forget city council. No, no, I, I already answered that question. I said that the union is a big part of it, but I do think you also need the DAs on board, just like we talked about in the last episode. Yes, and you need the DAs and you need the CCRB. Uh, CCRB, I feel like the unions could do a better job fighting against, but it it kills morale when you lock someone up. You said we're going to lock some up, someone up 100 times. By the way, we know that this is just fantasy land. The, the, the unions aren't going to back the cops like this. But when you lock someone up 100 times or you beat the shit out of this poor lieutenant and you see the guy out the next day, it makes you not want to do your job. So you absolutely need, you can't have, it's the left hand and right hand. You can't have just, it, we agree it all starts with leadership, but you, you need, John, you said this on Newsmax, the initial arrest is only the beginning only invited to America will, would this behavior be allowed and, and treated as a misdemeanor. And then on the streets here of New York City, I've never seen so many drugged out people, literally with needles in their arms. And the cops are told they can't do anything about it. So they've effectively, the Democrat leaders have put the handcuffs on the police versus the criminals. Absolutely. Progressives in our blue cities have, have created a criminal first society. They're putting victims last. Victims are nowhere to be found in any of this legislation, in any of the policy. And again, they're putting the onus on the police, right? The LA uh, is gonna create a task force, but what is that gonna do when we have DAs that are letting these people walk out the door? It's time that not only that citizens start speaking up against these elected officials who are creating this criminal first society, but also hold police managers that are appointed by these progressive elected accountable and have them on the pulpit answering questions and saying, why are the, why is this continuing to happen? Why are we creating task force and all this other things? We have laws existing on the books that aren't being utilized. We need to get back to proactive enforcement where the DA is on board. The arrest is just the first part of, of solving crime. It, it's, it goes a lot further than that.
You can't have only the police putting handcuffs on people and then the DA lets them out or they, 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 they cop a plea. They don't do any time. It is only the initial uh, aspect of cleaning up the city. It starts with the police and it'd be great to have the unions get behind us and do that. But you need more help going forward. If you seriously want to clean up the city, I, I, I think I you need both. I, I agree 100% with what you're saying. And like that is exactly right. The DA should do their job 1000%. But so should the police department. And like, let's call it for real. Guy gets called, arrested 100 times. The same cop arrested him 100 times? No. Some of these cops have been on the job five years. They have six cops, seven cops. You know, and how many guys are really collar guys in the precinct that even know who the perps are, know what, 5%, 3%? I don't even know what that is that are actually into, all right, I know I locked that guy up. This is what happened in his case. This guy, there's not that many guys that know that information. Most of the cops that are out on the street today get their information from the news more than they know the information. And and that was true when I was a cop, and I'm sure it's way worse now. Um, and and like that's why I think that I think that we're doing a terrible job because we all have been emasculated from the. Yes. I agree 100. percent And so I also agree. I also agree that it all starts with leadership. Yeah, leadership. I say in multiple, almost everything I tweet, cops can clean up this city in a heartbeat. If the woke, cowardly leaders would just let us and use our enforcement skills or uh, ability, use them in the right place. You let BLM and Antifa burn down the city, but you have no problem going to Staten Island and locking up grandma. Yeah. That's bullshit. Common sense needs to make a comeback. But again, it starts with now, leadership. You know, I agree that. At some point, yes, we would need the DAs on board to, you know, wrap everything up really nicely. But I think what John's saying, in, in which I agree, because I saw it myself, and I, I'm going to explain why. So the cops are in a position right now where they don't make arrests anymore. They're disengaged from the public. And it's because of the leadership that we had, we had former Chief Terrence Monaghan actually tell the job that they will not be pushed to make arrests. And that's where we started to really retract from it, right? In actual video, Paul, and he I know you would never call an AP that it's a crime. Yes. Call IB on your sergeant. Call IB. I can't. So do they it retracted it. from retracted from from making arrest. We had former Mayor De Blasio you know, who came with this neighborhood coordination program, where it started to be hung a thug, and the, and the cops were not doing <laughs> actual police work, right? And now you see there. Now you see there's actually no point of making arrest because it's not going to be prosecuted. You go into a substantiated CCRB, you go into face of a liability, so you complete withdrawal from it. If John Shell, the rest of the upper echelon, and the unions got together and told these cops, even though the DAs will not prosecute, even though you are going to get a substantiated CCRB, even though you are going to face civil liability, we have your back. That CCRB will be dismissed. We will get that off your record. The union will pay for your civil liability. You will not face any discipline. You will do your job and be fully supported. That's where I think the change would happen. And I'll tell you this. So one day I was doing paperwork. I was a special operations lieutenant. And at the end of my career, about the last year, I transitioned to the special projects lieutenant, which meant I would sit inside the precinct and oversee different units because at this time it was completely tainted with eight sets of charges for civilian play review board. If I if I would have stayed out of the precinct, they would have made a Derek Chauvin out of me. So with that being said, I was actually looking at paperwork. And one of the cops I had in this in the, in the NCO program, I looked at paperwork and I said, wow, he's got seven years on the job and he never prepared you you knew it as a 250 pool, a stop question and frisk report. I said, wow. This must be an error. He has seven years on the job. He never repaired one of these reports. So I sat up that one day and I said, this is a mistake, right? Tell me this is a, a, this is a mistake. He said, no, I, I never did one. I said, wait a minute. Hold on a minute. This is the bedrock, the foundation of police work. In seven years, working for the New York City Police Department in the South Bronx, one of the most volatile precincts 
in the city to help the community. You never, I mean, you were working a, a steady area. You never looked at a complaint report and said, wow, there's a, there's a robbery pattern going on here. There's a guy wanted for committing robberies. He wears a red hat, black pants, and, and, and boots, and you never saw someone fit that description, and you tried to stop them, to question them, to stop these robberies? He said, no. I said, what, what are you doing? You just respond to 911 calls, and that's it. And that's exactly what he was doing. And he didn't even realize that he wasn't actually doing police work because of the environment and the way he was trained on this job. I, I, I do. I do believe people. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I say it's for, for you that the time frame that you came on the job, it's probably shocking to you. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I was just talking to my friend who was a fireman and he was telling me how uh, this one particular fireman got to a, uh, a job or run, I think they call it. And he was on the nozzle and he said, I'm not going in to put out the fire. And I believe if you're a fireman or a firewoman, you should put out the fire, right? You shouldn't, you shouldn't take this job if you have a problem running into a burning building. I believe if you're a cop, you should make arrests. If you don't want to ever stop someone or 250 them, or we used to call it tossing someone, uh, then don't take the job. Go work at Home Depot. And if you're at Home Depot and you're a stock boy, I believe you should stop the shelves. I believe that you should do, you know, you knew full well what you were getting into and being a police officer involves making arrest. I'm just saying that it, it has a, a very demeaning effect when cops do their job and, and you're right, CCRB is a huge issue and it would make a big, big difference. It does all start with leadership. It would make a, a profound difference if the union and, and the bosses got together and said, you know, we're the first part of this and we're going to back our cops. That would, that, that would mean everything, but you still, it would still be helpful if you had cops, cops who were getting their asses kicked, not watching the perp, you know, seeing them outside next day, basically harassing the cop all, all over again. And I, I would, I would bet you, John, you can open this up to the people in the comment section. I noticed that a lot of people that comment uh, on a lot of the podcast, the, the people that almost all of them agree with what, we, what you guys say, usually came on around that time. And the people that agree with some of the stuff that I say usually came on around the late 80s, early 90s. So that just, it doesn't prove, but it suggests that it really is two different police departments. And we didn't have to deal with the iPhone and all this other stuff and body cameras but that was allowed to happen. Didn't you say that the union signed off on the on the body cameras because they were getting fifty dollars extra a check? Fifty dollars a check. That's it. They yeah, that's disgusting. Extra. $50 that's disgusting. For them? No, they don't have so, to wear the body cam. They've never wore the body cam. See, put that. So that. So in that sense, I agree one hundred percent. It starts at the most basic level, not just the union, but the cop sergeant, the lieutenant, and the CO. And, and they had our back back then as long as you were doing good police work. You would not hear a chief come over the radio and say what he said to begin with. You wouldn't hear anyone interfere. But you certainly would not hear someone say, were any shots fired by MOS? The first thing they would say if they're going to intervene is, any cop hurt or injured? Did they take fire? Do we need, you know, a roll a bus, have a bus roll, you know, have someone in route. What's the status of my guys up there? Do we need more units? Not, oh shit, we're going to make the news because this cop fired a round. It could be that the perp is standing right in front of him, you know, drawing down on the cop. But his main concern is what you said, you know, we're going to have a headache now and, and a clusterfuck. And now I have to, you know, worry about the media and I have to report to the media. I don't think, I think that has more to do with how the job has gotten. And it's, it's, it's happened this way slowly. I was watching um, one of the videos where people were protesting in support of the Cuban people who are coming here to flee communism. And they interviewed a lot of these people and they said, how do you feel about the, the college liberals on campus saying they want socialism and they want communism? And they all were like, you don't know what you're talking about. We fled, we stayed on rafts to get here. You don't see people going from this country over to Cuba or Venezuela. They're all trying to get here. But one of the things that this 
person said that stuck in my mind is she said, it happens slowly. You slowly start to lose some of your freedoms. What would be your message to young people that think socialism would be a good idea here in America? Look yourself in the mirror of Venezuela and Cuba. You do not ever want anyone, not even close to socialism, to come to this country. In Venezuela, there's not food, uh, medicine, education, no, nothing, yeah. nothing. I left my home country 20 years ago because of this, and it's a gradual process over time. Little by little, power is taken away from the people. And in the police department, I believe it happened the same thing. It didn't really change overnight. George Floyd was an anomaly, right? Like everything went out the window in 2020 with the summer of love. But I do think like the body cameras, the business cards, the, the precincts having cameras, it's, it has slow, and now you've changed, you've created this new police department where it's almost impossible to do your job. And CCRB has way too much power. They didn't have that. When I was a cop, CCRB made a suggestion they would say, we, we recommend, you know, the cop lose a day or whatever, however it is they would word it. Now, you had your charges strictly from CCRP. That's, you can't put someone who hates you in charge of, of, of your well-being. Yeah, I, listen, I, I, don't, I don't know. But my, my, the whole thing is, I get what you're saying. And the, the job is, became almost impossible. But it's, it's more impossible because of the leadership. And yes, and it's and that's exactly what and that's exactly what's going on. The cops don't care when the DA doesn't prosecute. They're not on our team. They never were. You know what the cops care about? When I get punched in the face and my CO says, well, you didn't go to the hospital and I don't want to take an assault, too. So you can't really charge them with assault on a police officer. And that happens way more, way more. That happens every day. Day, every day in the New York City Police Department, there's a CO that doesn't want to take an assault on a police officer charge, and that is demoralizing to the cops. But it's so, also it's also the system that they're in. It's okay to it's okay now to tell someone you're not going to make an arrest because the DA is not going to do nothing. I, I, I have a friend, he's, he lives in, a, in, a, in an affluent area in Staten Island where they're getting their cars broken into and the cars stolen at a ginormous rate. Crime isn't down there. Jobs aren't up there. Crime has skyrocketed there. Skyrocketed. It's up in hundreds of percent. The, you don't hear the mayor or the police commissioner talk about that. And what he told me is he went to a community council meeting and, he, and the CEO of a command along with his community affairs cops and whatever they call the crime guys now, told them, we can't do anything because there's so many of them that even if we arrest one of them, there's just more coming. And I'm like, dude, please tell me. I think me I've that. heard of that. Yeah. Please tell I'm me that. Didn't tell you that. Please tell me that you did. They didn't tell. He's like, no, that's exact. And he's a smart guy. He's He makes a lot of money. He's like, they said, and he labeled it out. I'm like, that is a complete, utter embarrassment and disgrace. That is something. Oh, we're not nine one one. There's nothing we could do. If they, like, and and it all starts from the top. And clearly, like you could see, you know. I agree. Yeah. Let me just say something. One thing, real quick, Eric. Then I'll let you go. Sorry. Um, you said the cop really doesn't care. You, you said you don't. Really, the cop really doesn't care if it gets DP'd. I agree with one exception. You get someone for a robbery and they knock it down to a grand larceny. No big deal. You get someone for a grand larceny and they knock it down to a petty larceny. No big deal. But when cops are getting assaulted, when they're getting their ass kicked, they want the perp to go to jail, bro. They do. I, I was talking to my captain. He was on a he was on a um uh, uh a protest. Something it's just like way before George Floyd. And he was telling me on the phone, we're both retired now. And he goes, Yeah, I turn around and boom, he says. He got clocked in the face. He said he went black. He literally saw stars. And they grabbed the guy and, uh, and they made an assault three. So he goes, yeah. So I went down there and I was talking to the ADA. I'm like, he goes, listen, I went to the hospital. Uh, he had a, a, his whole entire eye was closed and it bothered him. 
that they made it a Saw three. I think I said I think it's adorable that he went down there because they hate cops. They're not going to care. But um, it I would say it affects cops personally if you're not going if if I'm if I'm on the line every day and I'm getting injured or hurt or someone tries to kill me and you knock everything down I'm livid I'm me personally if you do something to me or my partner but you want to you want to you know shoplift at a CVS you make the 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 argument well they have insurance that's what insurance is for nobody got hurt I don't think there's any skin in the game but you you know you you try to shoot a cop and you don't charge attempted murder you charge assault cops are going to get are going to get pissed and and rightfully so that's the only difference i think most of the time they don't care unless they're injured eric sorry uh no problem it's important i, I you know I, I think uh it's a great perspective it's true I, I think that it just shows though that because there's no support the cops get assaulted at a rate that we've never seen before it's a new phenomenon and i say it all the time and i fear for this and unfortunately i think it is going to happen think a cop is going to lose their life from a uh, from an adversary in a physical confrontation where there's no firearm. And I really hope I'm wrong. I don't want it to happen. But I mean, the laws of probability say so. I think this lieutenant that got his head badged and is lucky to be alive, he's in his early 50s. He's not in tip-top shape. Uh, he easily could sustain a, a severe head damage from those, those punches. Uh, again, I want to go back to talking about Civilian Complaint Review Board. So John and I have attended meetings pretty much on a monthly basis. The meetings are held on a monthly basis, and John and I have attended virtually. And when you listen to these meetings, they are fueled with anti-police rhetoric, anti-police sentiment. And it really begs the question, those hired working for the Civilian Complaint Review Board, what are they doing in the outside world when they're not at CCRB? Are they taking part in these protests? Are they taking part in these riots? Because... One would believe that by the rhetoric that we hear there. And uh, it's it, it really is it's damaging. I, I never said to abolish the CCRB and get rid of them. I think that as police officers, we bear accountability and responsibility. I think that we do need layers of oversight to keep us in check. But we need fair treatment and due process. So we're not getting that because they're just fueled with bias. You heard it from the executive director, John Dar Jonathan Darsh. It's fueled with anger, just complete emotional disdain for the police. Uh, there's no fair chance. So that's why I just want to send this message out. I've sent it before on social media to uh, our viewers. I, I just want to say it again. No one has attended, but I, I would like if anyone would want to partake, you don't have to speak, but you can listen and just really listen. If you're active in the police department or you're retired or you're just a family member or you're a citizen, you, you'd like to hear what's going on at the civilian player view board. There's a meeting December 13th. It's going to be at 4 p.m. You can attend virtually if you want to attend in person, but you can turn attend virtually. That's what John and I do. And you can listen to what's going on at the CCRB. If you feel bold enough, if you like to speak, it's your First Amendment right. They have to allow you to speak. I'm actually challenged that. And I've actually been afforded now to speak every time in the meeting. I, I, I've been sure that it's important that you act on that. So it will be 7.13 at 4 p.m. If anyone is interested, I'll put the link out on social media. We'll, we'll put it out. If you just want to contact John or... or, or or myself, or Paul here, and we'll, we'll give you the link so that you can register and listen to what's going on at the Civilian Review Board and be a participant so that we can make some change. Absolutely. So I think we should start to wrap this up. It's an hour 45 we're going on. Uh, micromanagement, 114. Paul, what are, you, what are your, your last thoughts on the, on the 114 incident and micromanagement as a whole? I think that it's demeaning. It's become dangerous. It's disgusting. I think it freezes and paralyzes those that were normally uh, in a position to make a decision. It will impact them going forward on the next job they get. I think something should be done. I know nothing will because he's so high up. Um, but nobody's gonna get, gonna get jammed up. They leave that for the cops. Um, I do think, just like I was saying before, the New York City Police Department and its members slowly started to lose uh, a lot of their power. And I'm not on a power trip. Obviously, the you know some of these people we discussed are, but um, it's 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 happened. You know, we always used to say, oh, you know, uh, screw the unborn, right? Because they're not on the job yet, so 
let's just worry about us and our contract. Well, you go forward one generation and now you get a bunch of cops that I can't imagine living with the, with the, uh, uh, being under that microscope because cops are under a microscope and that will drive you insane that, you know, that's one of the reasons why life in prison is, uh, you know, it's meant to make you uncomfortable because you're watched all the time. And, um, it doesn't happen in any other profession. It's been allowed to happen. And John, I agree with you in that aspect, 100%. The unions need to get on board. They should have not let it get this far out of hand, um, what they have. And I don't know, I don't know how long it would take to turn around, but you could, you know, it starts with the top. We all, we all agree that leadership is the most important thing, but the micromanagement, I mean, why would you want cops to hand out business cards? What's the point of that? I could see before I came on in the Tompkins Square Park riots, there were a bunch of cops with their nightsticks hitting people. And a lot of them had uh, electric tape over their, over their nameplates or they were missing, they were, sorry, they were missing shield numbers. So I could see that, you know, you, you should be identifiable to the public. Well, that's why your shields have numbers on them. And that's why you have a nameplate. Giving out business cards it's just, it's, I'm telling you, I firmly believe it's only meant to demean police. You want my contact card again? I'll take I'll it. Sure. Why not? Yeah, we'll have enough. We had enough interaction at this point. And I cannot imagine working a tour or a double and going home to your spouse and not need a couple of hours just to decompress because the pressures are enormous. And again, it's not coming from, oh, I might get killed. I might get shot. It's the internal pressure from the job itself. And, and it's really sad. And that's why a lot of cops are leaving. And unfortunately, a lot of cops are no longer with us because of the pressure. And, and the unions definitely play a role on that. And I wish they would care more about it than, than taking pictures with certain people. I, I like to talk about two things here, right? So first, I think they're the only one that could put pressure on this failed leadership is the unions. And we have to stop saying, and we have to stop with this culture in the police department just accepting that the unions are absolutely useless. We just spoke about the body cameras being agreed upon for $50, approximately was 50 to $52 biweekly raise for those body cameras. Where is that raise going? Well, I could tell you where that raise is going. That's going back to the union. Union dues, <coughs> excuse me. Union dues are $51.84 biweekly. So that raise went right back in their pockets. The only one that could put pressure on this failed leadership is the unions. The union is supposed to be the voice in fight for the cops. I think the cops, all rank and file, part of a union, should stop paying union dues today. That would cause immediate change. These guys are eating well. They're surviving on union dues. They do not live the life of a cop. They do not bear the gun belt. They do not wear body cameras, but they live a lavish lifestyle where the cops are out there suffering. They didn't even get these 12 hour tours that are supposedly uh, applied to them. Now, the second thing I want to say is who's going to put the pressure on this leadership if it's not the union? New York City Council doesn't care because they want the police abolished. They enjoy the fact that it's it's by failed leadership. They're watching the police department crumble. It's being run by an incompetent mayor, excuse me, who's totally inadequate. The public doesn't care because they, they don't want to see the police. The media has shown the anti-rhetoric. So everyone's enjoying watching this failed leadership. The only one, and I say the only one that could put the pressure, is the union. And that's it. We need to stop paying these union dues. They want the po police department to crumble. And the only way that we're going to see change is by getting them all out. We need a new mayor eventually that's actually for law and order, for common sense, that actually cares about the police department, that's actually going to put the right people in the right place, and then he or she has to support them so that they can support the entire department. That's the only way that we'll get back to societal law. I also, John, just one second. I also think it would be helpful if the union stops giving all this money to candidates and politicians like Kathy Uckel. Uh It was a great, great job of you guys exposing that. Come on, man. That's, that's a slap in the face. Well, they won't endorse candidates in tough races. 
they don't endorse pro police candidates. They they endorse far left candidates and they give they give money. Listen, I I I agree. I don't I I just don't. I think the pressure needs to come from the rank and file on the unions, and they're not getting it. They're sitting nice and comfy. People don't even know what the unions are there for, what they get from them, what what the bylaws are, what they're entitled to. I know I didn't. I know probably it's probably true for ninety nine percent of everybody. Um, but again, it's the leadership. I mean, and I think the 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 pressure they're feeling just from this little podcast and just from two guys like tweeting, it, it's ridiculous. It just shows that they know that they're failing. You know, and I do think there needs to be some sometimes my management needs to come down to a micro level, but they don't they're not capable of seeing what that needs to happen. They're not capable of seeing when they should hone down when there's a problem, when there are people that are making a living showing how emasculated the New York City Police Department is and they're not putting a stop to that right away. That that might need a little micromanaging. That I would put an order out right away. This does not happen. I would put a video out. I would put training material out. This is what they'll be arrested for. This, this is, this is, this is what you're going to say to the DA. This is what what he did. He acted violent and tumultuously. Approached me in this behavior, saying he wanted to take my firearm. That's when we need a little micromanaging. Not when we have the men and women on the scene. Uh, in a very dangerous situation and you're making it even more dangerous for them. I think that Kaz, uh, Assistant Commissioner Kaz Daughtry, I think he needs to get put in his place immediately from Chief Shell, from Chief Jeffrey Madry, from Caban. Not, not that I think that Caban knows what's going on in the police department, but from, from people that do care about what's happening in the police department other than parties or promotion ceremonies that you cannot dictate what strategically is going to happen on a scene that you are not standing on because you do not know what's happening on there. Um, so I think it's a really, really tough. Uh, I think it's just, it's just a really, I feel bad for everybody. And honestly, I think about it all the time about the mandate. And like, there are times that I miss being a cop. I think I just got forced out of my career so quickly that, you know, I, I didn't get really like closure out of it. But I also think as when I listen to this and I watch all this stuff unfolding, I'm at the same time that I miss it, I'm glad I'm not there. Because I'm like, you know what? It it's really bad now. It really is really bad. And 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 that's all I got for this. So if you guys got anything you want to add, you know. So the the last thing I want to add, and I want to ask you guys this, because I think this is important. I think there, you know, an organization has to be shaped like a pyramid. And there has to be one person at the top that is the ultimate leader to, in order to have a direct vision. Other than Philip Banks and not the mayor, because <clears throat> it appears to me that they're all competing for who is the head dog. Who do you think is the actual leader of the police department right now? You want to go first? Me? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I would say Adams is probably, well, you guys would say, Guys, right? I mean, I, me personally, I think no, it's not Caban. I think that <laughs> Shell's leading from behind, but I think, I think that, I think that Kaz has all the power. Madry's nowhere to be found. He's lately out the door soon. Phil Banks has took a back seat. I think he's going to be out the door soon. Um, Caban is at a, I don't know, he's hanging I, out with the Fritos. Uh, Consilla, I have no idea. Maybe she's going to Israel. Maybe she's going to Qatar. I don't know. Like, I personally think that Shell's leading from behind. And as much as we make fun of Shell and we poke at him, I do think that if Shell worked for a different mayor, he would actually be a very good leader. I do. Yeah. I agree. I agree. And I think that I think that right now John Shell is leading the department and ultimately trying to like groom Kaz where he needs to be. And I think that's a problem for the, for, for the men and women. I think they really don't know exactly who is the leader. And that's a huge problem. Huge problem. Uh, I, I think we really covered a lot of aspects of this. I think my manager just, I think we completely exposed it. And what you said, John, is exactly what we were saying earlier. You could micromanage a system in a process. And that's what they're doing, right? If you, 
if you give the cops a direction about when to make arrest, particularly like famous Richard, you're micromanaging a, a process, but you're not micromanaging people. And I think that's the best takeaway. I think they, I hope they listen to this and understand that. Micromanage the process, but not your people. Paul, you got anything you want to add before we go? Just uh, when you were saying, we were talking about before, the job is telling you one thing about when you can't, if you, if filming inside the precinct should be allowed and law is telling you something else. When you brought up about these other guys harassing Well, cops, that's really fun. No, I, but I want to say there's a difference. In, it, it, when it comes to filming inside the precinct, there's two different people that you have to listen to. There's the law and then there's the people on our job. When it comes to harassing police officers the way they're doing, they are breaking the law. There are harassment statutes and disorderly conduct and OGA and all this other stuff that the police are refusing to enforce. And the more you let these so-called peaceful protesters do that, the more likely they are going to become rioters. And you need to stop it immediately. If you go and harass a cop the way they're doing and filming it, they need to be arrested and charged. And I do agree 100% with you on this, John. If the DA throws it out, who cares? He does it again tomorrow, lock him up again because they're going after you personally. And I think if they, if they did that, it, it might stop. It, or at least it, would, it wouldn't demean the cops and, and you know, the, the police department, department has been gelded. And I just, I hate to see it. Listen, I'm just going to give the police department a free tip before we go. Open up mass arrest processing. Every night for the, until these right until these agitators stop, open up mass process in one police plaza and have three computers in there. And that is it. And do not get anybody out of there quick. Let them take their sweet ass time. Make sure the guys voucher everything. Inconvenience these people the way they're con inconveniencing you. They're going to ruin your holidays anyway. You guys are this is this. This is the heart of the summer for you guys. You guys are going to be working every night through your holidays, through everything, they are not going away until we put it to bed. And the only way to do it is to inconvenience them. Because let's face it, even even when during all those other times, the RNC, all those other times, nobody really got in trouble for that. Regardless what they did, nobody went to jail for any of that. What happened to them? They got inconvenienced. Took them hours or days to get out, right? And what happened at the end of it? They sued and years later, they won money. Who cares? They're going to sue and win money anyway. Slow, inconvenience these people, lock everyone up. The zero tolerance that you have for grandma on Staten Island, you should have a way more tolerance on Staten Island and zero tolerance for what's exactly. going on. Exactly. Exactly, bro. And that's how you put this to bed. Um, so, guys, show your financial future. You know, if you're getting ready to retire, give our friends at Lady Law Blue a call. If you're in retirement and you're unhappy with your financial advisor, Give your your our friends at Lady Law Blue a call. If you don't have a financial advisor, just give them a call. It's a free call. John and Henry, they're great guys. I'm sure you like them. Um, give them a buzz. Guys, uh, Eric, you want to end this off? 265 Police Live. Everybody, thanks for watching. Be safe out there. Take care. Law enforcement professionals dedicate their lives to serving and protecting our community but who's protecting their financial futures? That's where Laidlaw Blue comes in. Our wealth management platform is specifically designed for the law enforcement community. Laidlaw Blue is a division within Laidlaw Wealth Management run by retired New York City detective John McDermott. His status as a retired detective uniquely positions him to establish a deep connection between Laidlaw Blue and the law enforcement community. Our platform is easy to use and provides a range of financial services, including investment management, retirement planning, and insurance solutions. With Laidlaw Blue, you can secure your financial future and provide for your loved ones. Our team of experienced financial advisors understands the unique challenges and opportunities that law enforcement professionals face. We're here to help you navigate the complexities of financial planning and achieve your goals. Laidlaw Blue.
Secure your financial future today. Book a meeting using the QR code displayed or call us directly on 888-901-BLUE. That's 888-901-BLUE.